Yes, I'm on now. Thank you all for coming here, and uh, I want to uh, give thanks to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters for uh, being on Treaty 6 territory, uh, homeland to the Métis Nation as well. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director here at the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Bev Pike, who's with us for a very short time. I picked her up at the airport this morning, and she's scooting back to Regina tonight, where she's installing a show at the Dunlop Gallery, a show called uh, Grotesque, which is a combination of grotesque and grotto. Medieval French, do I have that right? Baroque era French. Baroque era French, yes. I was close. Uh, Beth is a senior artist here in Canada, and she's, uh, 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 she's very, very well known, especially in Winnipeg, where she's uh, lived and worked for many years. Uh, she's in collections, I've got to deal with these papers here, she's got such a long CV. Um, she's in uh, collections across the country, uh, including the Robert McLaughlin Art Gallery, um, Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina, the Tate Modern in London. Uh, she's uh, the Banff Center in the uh, Paul D. Fleck Library and Archives, uh, the Feminist Archive, Trinity Road Library in Bristol, UK, uh, the OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto, many, many collections. Here, I've got, oh, she's been reviewed and discussed in uh, many, many uh, art journals and popular, the popular press, including the Winnipeg Free Press, Border Crossings many times, Prairie Art, uh, sorry, Prairie Fire, Fire Journal, um, CBC, she's done lots of radio and TV interviews. Uh, she's had uh, a long list of solo and group shows. I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, at the uh, um, the Grenfell Campus Art Gallery at Memorial University in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, Har uh, Hamilton Artists Inc. in Hamilton, of course, St. Mary's University Art Gallery in Halifax, uh, University of Manitoba, the list goes on and on. Latitude 53, the new gallery in Calgary, AKA Gallery here in Saskatoon. That was in 1990, so she's family. Um, the list goes on and on, and she's a very, very uh, senior, well-respected artist. We're very lucky to have her here. Um, uh, as I said uh, at the top, she is uh, installing her show. That opens up at the Dunlop Art Gallery this Friday, and that will be going for, I don't know how long. Till March. Till March. So we should all have a chance to go down to Regina and check that out. The show, as I said, is called Grotesque. I give you Beth Pike. Sidebar, the last time I was on CBC was on a show called uh, Now or Never. Totally unrelated, but I was Winnipeg's Cat Whisperer. So you, it's a podcast, you can look it up and I give advice to a young couple who were trying to integrate their dogs and their cats. And luckily for me, uh, they did everything wrong, so I was able to sound pretty clever on that. <laughs> about your cats. Um, so what I'm going to do is play the trailer for a documentary on me that was just made. Uh, it's 30 seconds, and if you want to see the full 30 minutes, it's about my creative process. That's what the local filmmaker wanted me to talk about. Oh, this is up right now? Yeah, I should have keep that, shouldn't I? Yeah, how do we access that? Uh, you have to, at the moment, you have to get borrow the DVD from Marcus. This is not a video. No, no, it's a separate link at the bottom. No, right, right, right. So I'm going to start with that and then go into this wild talk. That's how I developed that skill as a child. With this mission to make con 
contemporary art, it's not something to trifle with. It's something you better use all your resources to do the best thing that you can. Put the intellect in the back burner. That, it doesn't belong controlling things at all. It's the nonverbal stimulation that will create something interesting. Pixelation is quite interesting because it's not in the original, but it's very evocative of what I'm going to talk about at the end. Of the We're ready to go. We're ready to go. Uh, I wanted to show you how we created sorry, our main. Sorry, sorry. Different talk. Go away. Okay, this is good. This is good. So I'm going to get that thingy. Okay. So I'm known for two things. Uh, my gigantic paintings and my feminist activism, protection for women's rights, uh, and so a lot of times I get a question, how is your artwork feminist? And I say, I have the element of surprise. And what lacks, so does Baroque. That's one of the biggest characteristics of the Baroque era, the original one and the contemporary neo-Baroque. So I'm going to give a first history about European Baroque was at roughly 1630 to 1780. And it was when multimedia art flowered and things, art forms that were invented, spectacular art forms that were invented back then were opera, ballet, dressage, table vivant. At the same time, there were blue stocking movement, there were feminist movements back then. At the time of general revolution in a social and political way and to do with the economy, economic base. So as a pushback, the rich Europeans invented Baroque to increase their fragile prosperity. And it's going to lead, I promise you, into my work. Um, they, which Britons, so I've been studying underground shell grottos in England. Rich people there created mountains of pointless garden architecture called follies in their uh, non-utilitarian, deliberately non-utilitarian gardens. And at the same time, there was this thing that I'm going to weave through this talk, which is tulip mania. Does anybody know tulip mania? Oh, good. Barking mad, actually mad. So tulips. In 1634 to 36, two years, people in Europe went absolutely bonkers over tulips. So people were traveling the world, uh, grabbing stuff, natural collection. Humans were being collected and put on display as well. Tulips became a thing that broke stock exchanges all over it. They just went absolutely nuts over tulips. And I'm going to link that to feminism. Women plotted revolution over a new drink that came to Europe called tea. So this. Antoinette's one of her bedrooms. This is the most popular one to see. Um, so this is talking about uh, main elements of Baroque. Affect is one of them. Baroque favors affect over classic proportion. So the just bombardment was a big characteristic of it. All art forms had a painterly basis. So you can see that here. Uh, Baroque privileged, and this is why it gets disparaged a lot, good composition over good taste. And here in Saskatoon and in Edmonton, good taste for decades was a criteria of uh, uh, good painting. It had to have good taste, the abstract expression of the room. Baroque appeals to, and this is where I get excited, our communal visceral experience. So this is a... Sorry? They get pixelated, I'm sorry to say. I can, I can make yeah. Mark, if you guys don't mind, please. Sorry? For some of them, we try, so I hope we. In the camera. Uh, in the middle. This is a ceiling in a grotto mm -hmm. that a rich guy near the Hampton Court Palace made for his girlfriend, his mistress. Oh, well, that's not too bad. <coughs> 
was on the slide show. Great clip. Yeah. Did you write some of your some of those your poems? There we go. Okay, so now I can control it. Yeah. Thank you. This is work I did in 1974. This is a thesis year, Alberta College of Art in Calgary. Why did I do it this way? It was feminist at the time. Uh, there were no, hardly any women students, no female professors, no female texts, no females in our DR history, nothing about women. There were a handful of us women. And what happened in Crits back then was that um, we got called sentimental, um, corny, uh, not very deep, crafty, all those sort of pejorative things that I'm sure nobody says anymore. Uh, so what I did is I painted a painting on top of a painting so that the professors couldn't get a beat on it. And it worked, actually. Lucky me. The next thing I'm going to talk about is, wait, I skipped a chapter here. This is a video game. It's kind of baroque, but in a gross way. Labyrinths, and eventually you'll get to them on more contemporary work. Labyrinthine forms are really a big part of the Baroque spectacle because they have the element of surprise as well, and they're spooky and unnerving. Your gravity, sense of gravity, and uh, stability goes. So the original Baroque and the neo Baroque that you see now in things like rock, sh rock sh uh, concerts or political conventions. It creates a mental labyrinth of inner versus outer, before and behind, real and imaginary, all happening at the same time, posed and impromptu or captured. So I used and still use labyrinthine images to protect myself from, I still do it, visual and gender bigotry. Not awful that you have to do that. There you are, it makes for good art. This is an actual grotto in Bristol in England. It's the entrance to it. Once you go through that door, so all these are stones, mostly, not shells. The shells are more inside. Uh, the curator of the Simmons private school, we call it a private school. And she opens, the curator opens that door and stands back because she knows exactly what's going to happen to you, which is boom. Because she flips on the light and the whole sense of gravity is gone because of the sparkles. Mm -hmm. So there's crystals and seashells, everything shimmering, the floor, the ceiling. You instantly lose your stability, which is the point. So I find that pretty cool. Uh, this is 1980. 1981, again, layering two paintings on over top of each other. I was dealing with uh, my mother's death at that time. This is just watercolor on 30 by 40 inch board. I was going through her estate. Chapter three, invagination, handy term to just drop at a cocktail party. Invagination, this is contemporary Baroque. So, You'll see invagination in my work in a second, where on, so a, a one-dimensional or two-dimensional artwork has more depth than that. You seem, it's, when you're looking at it, it seems like you can go in it or around it. So the paper itself, the flat paper, is not a physical medium or a space, but it's a membrane or a state between emptiness and emotion. And you can Google the history of the surface because people have Deleuze as one of them. It's linked to the history of the folds. You could wander around in that space. Invaginated joining is another metaphor. Body, mind, inside, outside, self, other, ideal, real, subject, object, object, and shadow. This is a grotto carved out of solid stone, southern England, and so you can't tell where the bottom is, can you? It's not easy. Where's the wall? Where do you go? That's the whole point. It's pitch black in there, 
So this is a flash on the camera. It's designed to disorient. And it's quite neat. You get the little visitor pamphlet and it says in typical English fashion, which I can say because I come from that background, it's not true that there were orgies in this place. Just to get you thinking about how not true it was. This is an invaginator, you could say, painting that I made in 1990. This is oil on canvas, eight by 10 feet, and I used as much girly texture and subject matter that I could. All these have silver and gold leaf underneath, and all these dots and things are um, sucky stamps, like lips and flowers and hearts. I was trying to s depict how I felt in my skin, so it was linked at that time to feminist theory about the body, how the female body produces awareness that is very different from art, historical, the canon. Chapter four is concatenation. This is neo-Baroque or contemporary Baroque. This is really interesting. Baroque tests the limits of our history by its chronological distress. Visually, you can see that here. If you had to say he's <coughs> such and so feet above that or such and so feet in front of that, how could you define, you don't have enough information or you have too much contradictory information or contradictory viewpoints, that's the whole point of it. This continuousness leads to particularity. So the forms don't recur. If you take one part out, maybe not the extremes, but if you took this part out, the whole thing would not work. Each part's interdependent. Concatenation, that's what it means. One part is significant within the entire overwhelming drama. So the foreshortening and uh, the lighting is critical to the read of the whole thing. If you think of a classicist painting, like, uh, I don't know who, Poussin or somebody, you can take that Roman soldier out and still get the point. But if you take some of this out, you're not gonna get the full boom that you that is designed. What I work with in my own paintings is a non-transcendent viewpoint <coughs> and a multiplication of screen spaces. You could put it that way, or you could just say have multiple viewpoints in it. This is, again, the Bristol Grotto. Can you read it? These are these huge, gigantic clamshells, like three feet across, and there at the base, they're holding the water that's coming down from Zeus way in the background that goes into this pond and then circulates back up. 300, 400 years ago, this would have been hand, hand pumped or some kind of Archimedes thing. Now the, the curator just goes around the corner and flips a switch to get the water going. So this has a combination of seashells. These are, um, not limpets, little, the things you eat. You know those seashells you eat. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I don't eat that stuff. And the rest are um, stones, semi-precious, some amethyst, and uh, all kinds of stuff. On the far right, you can see some invaginated uh, conches, what they, we're using them. Uh, so the rich guys were sending galleons to the Caribbean, this is 1600s, 1700s, and they would just trawl up the, the seafloor to get, so they were competing against each other, so it's some 10, five ships and 10, 10 ship fleets to just bring back seashells for these amusements. No function at all. This is one of my works from 1998, again dealing with um, grieving. I was also finding out that uh, there, were, there is an ongoing research into when you're an organ recipient, you also receive sensations and memories and ways of thought and feeling that you didn't have, that come with the organ. How cool is that? So I was thinking, well, the person who died or the people who died maybe left something with me or, anyway, that was the point of that one. At eight feet high by 20 across, So this chapter five is about demiurgery, which is a feminist I kind of like, uh, a different kind of feminism. I like beheading, that's kind of a nice book. In art, there's two versions here. You probably 
I know you probably studied these both. Engagement with a demiurge, a demiurge is a subordinate deity uh, and it's a powerful creative force, a powerful narrative symbol that you see a lot in classic art histories in the canon. It's performative and participatory, the angle, this is Caravaggio, Judith killing Holofernes in the heyday of his 1612. So she's kind of killing him by doing something like you might do with a bit of cheesecake, me easy, right? But look how gentleski does it. This gal is ripping up a house, and her maid is too. So, woman, have you studied this in art history? Yeah, I'm not telling you anything new. It's still fun to think about the romanticization of Judith killing Holofernes or raping thousands of women just like Harvey Weinstein. If I understand that story properly, he was not very nice and she snuck in and did this just to get him to stop. What I link that with is this piece from 2008, Hymenal View of Alchemy. So that's molten rock. I was trying to see if I could paint a cave. You're inside a cave made from molten lava, looking out to lava coming your way. That was the experiment with this piece. Chapter six is loss of rational control. You've all studied this, Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Brunini, dated 1652. Loss of rational control means this is a classic example of that, right? She's in ecstasy thinking of God. Performance means, it means performance theater and reality collapsing, which leads to visual tension about what makes something possible. Interesting way to write about this piece. What is actually fact? What's fiction? Why do they work together? So loss of rational control, that's the whole point of Baroque. So that the people giving us the uh, rodeos, the political conventions, the football game, halftime shows, all that stuff. The point is not entertainment, the point is to make us into sleepwalkers. That's the point, to overwhelm us to the degree, and repeat overwhelming, so you get the raw concept of the political in one week. You can have all these, and you're just completely not writing letters to the editor anymore. You're just so overwhelmed. That's why Baroque started, and that's why we see it now. So whenever you look at it, example, I was talking earlier about huge new architecture. Like in Winnipeg, we have the Museum of Human Rights. Overwhelming. When you see that stuff, look for a need for the politicians and the rich guys to want to control us. So go into the human rights if next time you're in Winnipeg and then think about what they're actually actually doing in that building and what are they trying to do because it's not what it, according to me, not what it looks like. It looks like a, a, an attempt to create the narrative to overwhelm us all. So loss of rational control, it strives against nature, has complicated contrapuntals, which you see clearly here. The force coming one way and the resistance coming the other way. And boldness as if empty fragility, which you, this is a really good example of that. This is marble, so it's stone. Has anyone seen it? Not yet. Yeah? Does it feel like that when you see it or does it feel like rock when you see it? you'll be my age and it'll bite your ears like you won't even believe. You won't be able to hear. So wear those headphones if you're going to bars and listening to crap bands. <laughs> Loss of rational control is breathtaking, it's billowy, it's weightlessness, restless animation. My work that I'm equating with that is this one that I, this is called Lunacy and I wanted to, it's nine, 2003. 
Eight by 20 gouache. I wanted to make the ugliest painting in the world. Uh, I wanted to make all kinds of mistakes and make it hideous and rubbishy just to depict that state you get in. Hopefully you never feel that state where nothing is going right at all. And you pick up the phone and you're thinking like Dorothy Parker, what fresh hell is this? And you open the door, what fresh hell is this? That's what I was trying to depict there. Chapter seven, there's 11 chapters in this talk, illusionism. So this is again the Bristol Grotto. So this is part of that thumping experience I was describing when the curator opens the door, but photography never picks up the, the animation of glint. It can't, it picks up one instant of it, but it's a visceral experience, that animation for you being in that space. So you're completely destabilized. What is that? Are we okay? Nobody's hurt? Okay. Um, seashells, uh, fist-sized stones, uh, Bristol limestone, there's amethyst in there, there's all kinds of stuff. But you, if you can imagine it being completely covered in sparkly things, these are the pillars that hold up. This is a fake cave. So they dug a lake and then they made a pile of dirt, then they cut a hole in the dirt and made a cave. This all here is different kinds of seashells. You can see the conscious, so you get an idea of the scale, because the conscious, you know, bigger than this. Um, there's anemones, there's coral, there's coral, not anemones. And then again, at the bottom of those clamshells. So we're in illusionism, notable tendency to dissolve horizontal. So there's lots of spiraling, vertiginous movement, dramatic light and foreshortening going on. So what I love about these shell guards is they're completely terrifying when you're in them. Often they're not lit, sometimes they're lit poorly. Sometimes there's a busload of tourists in them and you have to sort of, you know, the alleyway, the, the pass, paths, passageways are only three feet so you have to move in an intimate way with the people from Germany or whatever. Um, vertiginous movement, so you you do that. The space makes you do this. Dramatic light, foreshortening, yes. Illusionism, uncertainty of perception. Is this what we think or see or mean really here? They're designed for that, that's the point. So you have a mystical experience, you go in there to think or have a tryst or have some champagne or write poetry, that's, that's the point of these. Illusionism leads to our embeddedness in one demonic, I'm saying, experience of viewing or beholding. There's only a handful of these grottoes left in England, um, but they're endlessly fascinating. I'll show you one in a second. Chapter 8, polyvalence, another good cocktail party term. It means forms underpinned by rigorous calculus. Oh, here's a detail. So you can see the coral the brickwork that holds the arches up. I'll jump ahead here. This is one of the, based on one of the grottos that nobody knows how old it is. It might be a thousand years old. Un, un, uh, they're unable to date it in uh, Margate, the southeast of England. The tunnels are based, that are actually my idea of, my rendering of what they look like. You know, you're going deep underground accidentally found in 1820 or something. I add in um, knotted sweaters, again linking back to the art theory about women's bodies and viscera and female experience. So that's what I was trying to do there. 2012, so this grotto series that I'm gonna be showing you the Dunlop started then with this piece. And under illusionism, I'm still going to throw this one. This is called Chill 2010. Uh, I wanted to see if I could paint mm, the act of swimming, what it would feel like to swim under ice, the Arctic. That's what I was after. That illusion. And again, the sweaters at the bottom, linking to your early work. Back to polyvalence. This is Las Vegas. Has anybody seen this? You must have. <laughs> Seven 
17 times <laughs> that year. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, and these fountains are, are all cute to music, so what could be more Baroque? You've got every discipline possible involved in this thing to make you part with your money. you got the uh, Romanesque type of architecture in the back. Is that the right word? It's like to overwhelm you. And all this stuff going on in the foreground. Bellagio Casino. Under polyvalence, forms underpinned by rigorous calculus. So you can see the structure is very important. It's not like the seashell grotto, which is a bit whimsical. This is like, man, we're going to knock you over. We want that money. Fanciful, fantastical. It's also bad taste. So that's one of the things that I work with in painting from this era is that after the modernism and postmodernism, this year is considered kind of corny and really bad taste and way too feminine, except for this one, I guess you could say. Uh, decay is also decayed Renaissance, and it, but it does objectify what's unspoken. This place with your gravity, this is a Welsh grotto, and it's a path, but it's also a creek. So imagine it doesn't look as safe as it, it and it isn't. So that this distance here, you have to make a little skip. And the way they've built that, you can't tell how deep that water is. And that's only one of a whole bunch of them. And that's the only way to get through this grotto. So all of that is very strategic. I think it's fabulous um, because it messes with your senses in such an appealing way. It's not like a uh, I don't know, carnival ride or something. This, you're going for a little nice country walk in this little grotto, but it's not as safe as you think. Polyvalence. The work of my own that I'm linking with that, this is um, called Deluge 2005. I wanted to see if I, if I could give the impression of a flood of movement from one corner to the other. That's what I was after. Chapter 9 is Bella Composto. I'm sure you've studied that, yeah? Or you will? It means unity of the arts, merging art forms. This is neo-baroque, or high Victorian baroque. So look for the need to control the masses whenever you see old stimulation like this. That's one table. So in the Baroque era, the princes in the Catholic Church, they were all fighting with each other, the Lutherans were winning, and so all the rich guys really needed to stamp down dissent by overwhelming everybody with opera and all kinds of heaven knows what all. But you can look up Baroque art forms and get a nice list. In the High Victorian era, same social problems in Europe, where industrialization was making the masses unionize and be kind of upset with the Luddite movement was active. So what happens? The rich people then require heavy ornamentation and lots of spectacles. So Tableau Vivant became popular again. Opera, classical, uh, symphonics. Symphony was also uh, a Baroque art form. That stuff came back at a time when the powers that be needed to control public dissent. Look for that today and look behind it to see it's not like for, it's not an accident. It's deliberate. Um, the, one of the Baroque obsessions was bringing pictures to life. So that's Tableau Vivant. Um, through animation, like we saw with the uh, Las Vegas image. It's a discourse of marvel. So why not talk about that in art history? It's, it adds emotion to the theory that we're studying. Discourse of marvel. There's a style of degeneration and disorder, intimidation. There's an overwhelmingness. It represses some sen senses in order to privilege others by combining a variety of art forms into one, better composto, tramples on the individual forms. So 
your abstract expressionist two stripes, you know, it's called Good Friday or something. This <coughs> stuff just wipes, wipes that out. It has a whole different purpose. It's aesthetics of wonder, of the science of miracles that leads to pleasure being confronted by new objects. I just think that's great. The aesthetics of wonder. So each art form merging with another, it multiplies the potential of each individual art form. Leads to quasi-mystical satisfaction, so back to the shell goddess, and I'll show you another one in a minute. With alternate rare experiences through improvisation and synesthesia. So when I write about my work, synesthesia is, that word is peppered throughout. Because I don't want people to look at this and say painting. I want them to look at this and say experience. It's engaging my balance. It's engaging. I think I can smell something. In these shell grottoes, you're not sure where gravity is. You're not sure if that glint is water or what's that smell or did I just hear a scurry? So you're really destabilized in these dark caves, which makes them pretty great. In sum, this is the one I just finished a week ago. Gazing Pond Chamber. So what I'm creating in the last decade is a series of rooms. I'm building my own underground shell grotto. This one's based on a hilltop shell house in Wales. So if we have to go and live underground, we will need a gazing pond chamber among other things. Here's a close-up of back to the Hampton Court House. You saw that I wrote that in the ceiling. That's a close-up of the ceiling. So you can see, and again, this is women in corsets, this is seven, 400 years ago, gluing these things together, sometimes making armatures. So some of these are not all on one surface. Sometimes there's a whole armature and you look through. It sticks out, it's encrusted, and then you look through it for more. of Scott's Grotto where it's not true to head or geese. So in the 17th century and the 20th century, when you see images of power using things like grotesques and idolation, so video games, or uh, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, all that stuff that, that comes at you, there's a reason for it. It's not a fad. There's a political, social purpose, economic purpose to it. Look for monstrosity, phantoms, condemned for forms of artifice. Now that's a term I won't explain because just hang on to it. And whenever you see some kind of Baroque or Neo-Baroque, is that a condemned form of art? Is that part of rape culture? Is it a condemned form of artifice? There's also, especially in movies uh, like that, the uh, hero movies, you know, there's some temporality of mythic doom. The world's going to end and only Bruce Willis can save us. Temporality of mythic doom. So style definition for the bizarre, or the pizzeria. So the pizzeria was a movement within the Baroque 400 years ago that was even more weird than the normal Baroque pizzeria. I'm linking it to feminism. It's not neutral. It names things. The bizarre has a purpose. You can read it. You can read its purpose. It quantifies. It involves incongruous detail. So with the Me Too movement, women are saying, you know, that guy who did that to me, actually, my complaint was valid. It wasn't incongruous, it wasn't a detail that was not important. So we're seeing, you can use these lenses or theoretical boxes to look at anything. Both Baroque and feminism rupture classical forms. Baroque and feminism both tweak, seek, <laughs> seek places of rapture, opulence, intensity. So these grottos, the approach often looks 
like this. You're walking along in a big, big, big park. It was the back 40 of Sandwich Guy in England. And there's a path, and you, a long path, and you go past the swan pond and the ancient Roman columbarium and the useless needle, which is a big tower that is no function whatsoever, uh, or the fake Greek ruin. All of these are called follies in England. Um, but this is your process. You're walking along a path, and you go, oh, what'll happen if I go in there? Same with feminism. If we change something, what'll happen? So this is one of my pieces. This is a piece from last year. It's a ballroom. <coughs> it's um, buried dense pavilion. So I was trying to imagine a space that could swirl uh, based on one of the grottos that I studied. So I'm going to have to go to that link. I've lost my place for that one I want to show you, but I'll do it in a sec. Um, so autocrats, which feminists are always fighting, they associate the bizarre with prideful rebelliousness. So in the past, not anymore, autocrats would say, those women are just too big for the britches, right? What they're saying, it's just a joke. What I did was just a joke. They're just taking it too seriously. Prideful rebelliousness is one of the ca uh, categories that they put feminists in to undermine the movement. Ridiculousness is another one. So we see that today, if you put in feminazi, if you Google that, you'll see all kinds of horrible things. That's not an accident. That's an attempt to dismiss women's uh, drive for fairness. Feminists associate the bizarre with how frequently women help other women to take up their own space. So that's partly why I consider my work feminist because I'm taking up a lot of space. And that can be uh, cheeky. It's not awful, but it can be. It can be seen that way. Um, feminists also associate the bizarre with how infrequently women and our thoughts and our cultures are visible. So I'm going to give you the five minute need for feminist test. We're almost done. So five minutes, that's all it takes. Five sections, one minute each. You just scroll through any radio. Scroll through your radio. Who do you hear? What voice do you hear? Look at any bookshelf, any magazine rack, any board list, any art magazine. Who's getting the shows? Which gender is it? So pick five of these and you'll see why we still need feminism. So back to Tulip Mania, and then I'll show you a picture of an actual, a real life grotto. There's a book on it by a feminist. I'm just going to read a couple of sentences from it, because I'm linking it to feminism. As I lay on the sun above somewhere, I thought still of feminists, slashes of brilliant blood welling from the bare, brown, shale-strewn slopes of the mountain. So it was written by a botanist looking for tulips, rare tulips. Wolves were nothing to them. Saints were nothing to them. Millennia had passed by on this slope while the feminists, wild as the wolves, slowly and joyously had covered, had evolved and regenerated itself. Even now, in their dark underground grottos beneath the rocks, so tulips emerged from the ground, the feminists were plotting new feats, reinventing themselves in ways that we could never dream of. minimize this, because I don't know how to do that. There we go. And open up. Where did it go? Like these two tabs. No, not that one. <laughs> but there, here, this one. This is good. This is one of the grottos. What will happen? There. So this is the last image I'll show you. This is a grotto half the size of this room. And they it's totally fake. It's it's built over fake lake. And so 
this is water that's, that is supposed to, on a good day, reflect these. These are made of lath. So if you have an old house, your walls are made of lath, but they're bent into these fake stalactites. Then they're covered in quartz shingles. And when you're in there, everything shimmers and reflects. Now, this stuff here is Bristol limestone. There's another proprioceptive trick. That Bristol limestone looks like vertebrae. So you're walking amongst columns, or these are stalagmites sometimes, sometimes columns of vertebrae, or piles of vertebrae, so piles of bodies, let's say, in amongst this celestial, it evokes very celestial, inspirational, these things coming down, the stalactites coming down. Immense amount of labor. So it was destroyed in the Second World War and it was just rebuilt. So if you ever get to go there, it's Paints Hill Grotto. So many proprioceptive things going on there, and that's what I'm after in my painting. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk that you gave. You put a lot of really interesting and, and somewhat disparate things together, and I, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you going back into art history and bringing up the Baroque, and that, that's quite interesting to me. But I'm, I'm still I'm confused because it seems like in your discourse on the Baroque and how you position it, it seems slightly contradictory. On the one hand, you sort of posit the Baroque as a kind of a political suppression, a mechanism for the uh, people who are in power to dazzle That's people yes. and divert their attention. Yes. Yes. And on the other hand, on the other hand, you position it as a kind of a um, an expression of irrationality, a kind of a resistance to order, and link it to a kind of a feminist impulse. So how do you reconcile those two things in the Baroque? Two ways. Um, it's a penchant I have for multiple interconnected types of irony. So it, it's a bit like Allison's work, where you just have a lot going on in your head at one time. So that's how I think. Um, now, what was my other answer? Ah, Baroque, one of the characteristics of it is a multiple coexisting viewpoints. That describes feminism, types of feminism. So that's the link I'm making. In my painting, I do that too. So it's not great painting because one viewpoint is from here, one's from here. If I wanted to do something as good as that Harry Potter, I'd have to be a designer to pull that really vertiginous gravity off, but uh, that's not what I want. So that's how I justify it, because it's Baroque, it can have multiple points of view. Yeah. I notice a similar kind of a contradiction going on in, the, in your painting. And on the one hand, the, the detail, the surfaces that you're painting are very Baroque, right? Mm -hmm. They're undulating surfaces with lots of stuff. But the overall composition is quite symmetrical yes. in most cases, right? Yeah. Yeah. That sort of goes to the other side and, and sort yeah. of reinforces it classical order. Symmetry was a broke trope. So if you if you look at a rock concert, there, there's usually uh, symmetrical light flashes happening. What that does is to do with our psychology or our sense of gravity or our proprioception. Baroque is a really important tool for overwhelming people. So churches, for example, big arches, there's a point to that. It's because it affects us viscerally having symmetry. So for me, it's not actually easy, it's not fun to paint uh, something that's a mirror image on one half of the other. I find it very confusing and hard to do. But my experiment is with trying to overwhelm through using deliberate symmetry. But I'm not very good at it, so it, it's not perfect symmetry, which is good in a way, because perfect symmetry is boring. You, your eye doesn't know where to go, like a photograph 
flipped. But the way I, it's very, it's an interesting thing to try. So I get somebody to flip a photo and stick them together. And what I see on one side, it's the same photo, only flip. I paint differently on the other. So you can see that your brain is cognitively perceiving the same thing in a different way, depending on what's up. That's what mine does anyway. So the neat thing about the Baroque is you can justify just about anything. <laughs> Chapters like concatenation and polyvalence, those are just general descriptions of main key points of the of Baroque now and then. Yeah, those are the characteristics. Yeah, common art historical descriptions of that period. <laughs> Good point. I never thought. <laughs> I was trying to do social control. Well, up to you what you want to do. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming. And you're welcome. Now this documentary on me is available through Marcus. You can borrow it. It's 30 minutes if you want. It's all about how I make art. Where it comes from. Good. <laughs>